are you all ready to read chapter 25 of Little Britches? We are continuing this book by Ralph Moody here at the Caribou Public Library for our chapter book story time. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Miss Erin and I'm so glad that you're here. So chapter 25 is called A Pretty Strong Current. I spent the rest of the afternoon helping Juan and Hai get the chuck wagon ready. It was really more of a blacksmith and harness shop than a chuck wagon. Juan's kitchen was only a big pantry with doors at the back. It sat on the open tailgate and was stuffed to the roof with flour, slabs of bacon, sugar, coffee, and potatoes. Two big water casks were fastened to the sides of the wagon's body, and Juan's pots and pans hung from the chuck box like warts on a squash. After all the branding irons, horn saws, and spare saddles and blacksmith tools had been loaded, <clears throat> it was my job to flush out and fill the water casks. I thought they held a thousand gallons apiece before I got them filled. Mr. Cooper ate dinner in the cook shack with the men, but he ate his supper in the house with Mrs. Cooper and the little girls. I was nearly through with my second piece of pie when a team drove into the yard and I heard Mr. Cooper come out of the house and call, Hiya, Fred. I thought the answer sounded like Fred Altland's voice. So I finished my pie as quick as I could and went out. He was so busy talking to Mr. Cooper that he didn't notice me until I went up close to the buckboard and said, Hello, Fred. Fred spit so quick he hit the high, the nigh horse on the hawk and said, Bye, dog, Spikes. I didn't hardly know you. Where the hell did you get that 10-gallon hat? It was a pretty good light gray hat. Tom Brogan had given it to me after I rolled the blue, the blue colt. It was a little too big, though, and he had to roll up some paper and put it inside the sweatband so it wouldn't fall off. I was right behind me, and he came over yelling, Spikes, be damned, there's this here's little britches, top hand cowpoke and bronc buster of the YB spread. Light down, you low-beard old son, and get the kinks out of your legs. Then he started to tell Fred about my riding the blue colt the first day he'd ever had a man's hand on him making it sound as if the colt had bucked a lot harder with me than he really had. I didn't just, I didn't like to just stand there, so I went over and climbed up onto the corral fence to look at my colt. He had been running around the corral until he was sweaty, and his co coat glistened blue as the sky in the light of the setting sun. I guess I was thinking about that without knowing it, and about high and the way the colt leapt into the air when he started his buck. The name Sky High came into my head before I ever knew where it came from. It was deep twilight before Hyde left the buckboard and came over to where I was. The colt spooked as Hyde came up to the fence, snorted, and stared toward us with his head held way up with his nostrils flaring. Hyde chuckled. Lots of fight left in the blue devil yet. Goodness, he's going to make a horse. We watched him for a while. He watched us. At last, Hyde said, didn't want to bust him too hard today. Didn't want to bust his spirit. Then after he rolled and lit a cigarette, he said, probably should not to, to have put you on him so quick, little britches. Your pa wouldn't have liked it. He took, to, took a couple puffs from the cigarette and blew the smoke up over the top rail. But if he's gonna be your horse, he's gotta get used to you from the jump. Ain't no two ways about it. I guess that Fred and Mr. Cooper had been telling him that he had let me ride the colt before he was broken enough. I didn't want him thinking too much about it because I was afraid he might not let me do it again. So I told him what I'd named the colt and asked him if he thought it was all right. Right, he said, fits him like a glove. Tell you what we'll do. We'll call that old cayuse of mine sky blue and make him, matched, make him a matched pair. It seemed like everything around the place started off with, by God, <laughs> I told myself I wasn't even gonna think of it. And then I'd be sure I didn't say it sometime when I wasn't thinking. Hmm. I went over to talk to Fred Altland before he went home and asked him not to tell mother about my riding sky high. He didn't say he wouldn't, but he stuck his hand out to me and I knew he meant that he wouldn't tell father either. We pulled out for the mountain ranch early the next morning. I'd hoped that high would saddle sky high and take most of the buck out of him as he'd done the day before so I could ride him up the mountains, but he didn't. I was just moping, mopping up the last of the syrup on my plate with a piece of hot biscuit when Mr. Cooper stuck his head in the cook shack door and said, you'll be riding topsy, little britches. Then, after he'd started away, he stuck his head back in and said, I'm giving you orders. Hi, don't you ever, don't you never let little britches fork that blue colt until you've got him plumb more down. 
Juan drove a four-mule team on the chuck wagon. Just as we were ready to pull out of the yard, Mr. Cooper told me again that Juan was my boss away from the home ranch and that I belonged to the chuck wagon. So I pulled Topsy in beside the near wheel mule. We waited by the gate while the men got the remuda from the corral and hazed it up the wagon road high toward the west. High was right behind them with sky high. He had the cold haltered and his head snubbed up close to his saddle horn. As he went past me, he called, Figure to give this little old cayuse some halter breaking on the way up. Sky didn't seem to like it one bit and plunged around to beat the band. But he couldn't do much about it because High's Blue just kept on jogging along, not paying any attention to him. Juan followed with the chuck wagon. Until we were out of sight of the house, I rode along beside the mules. But Topsy didn't like the dust that the wagon stirred up. She kept blowing her nose and bobbing her head. Then Juan waved me to go ahead with the men and yelled, Adelante, adelante, muchacho. I had picked up enough Spanish from the Mexican section hands to know what that meant, and I dug my heels into Topsy's, Topsy's ribs. I never looked back at the chuck wagon until we were in the little green valley, valley between the hogbacks and the mountains. I had felt kind of bad that I was only going to be the water boy and helper to the cook, but it turned out a lot better than I expected. Juan didn't want help, even if I had known enough to be any use to him. All he let me do was carry water for the men and bring in bundles of dry scrub oak for the fire. Juan had a Mexican, <coughs> excuse me, a Mexican water skin that he tied behind the cattle of the cantle of my saddle. It was a dog skin, and I don't know how in the world they ever got the dog out of it because there wasn't a break in it anywhere, except at the neck, tail, and feet. It had been tanned and polished until it was as smooth as a lady's glove and a brownish yellow color. <clears throat> the legs hung down on each side of the saddle. They were the drinking tubes and I had to fill it, fill it through one of them. Too close to close them tight enough so that they wouldn't leak, all I had to do was fold them over and clamp on a split stick like a clothespin. The brakes at the neck and the tail were sealed so that they didn't leak and they were hand sewn with double rows of fine cord that High, High said was cat gut. Every morning that first week, High took the kinks out of Sky High before we went out to work the cattle, before he went out to work the cattle. And every morning the colt broke wide open for a few seconds, but the white didn't show round his eyes anymore and he didn't tremble. After he had ridden Sky for a couple of miles, we'd change saddles and I would let me ride him for a while, but he always rode his own blue right beside me. The colt was always crow hop. The colt always crow hopped a little after I got on, but he never did any hard bucking. I let me ride farther each morning. Then Saturday, he tied the water skin on behind my saddle and rode with me all morning while I took water to the men. Sky High didn't like the legs of the skin dangling against him. I could never tell when he was going to spook or crow hop and I had to keep my knees pinched in so tight that I didn't get spilled. <laughs> By noon, my legs were aching to beat the band from keeping them pinched up so tight on the saddle, and I had a lot of sagebrush scratches on them because I couldn't always make Sky go right where I wanted him to. While we were eating dinner, Hi told me to put on my saddle on Topsy and to drag in half a dozen bundles of wood to hold one over until Sunday, and then we'd get away early for the home ranch. I didn't stop to have supper with the YB fellows at their home ranch, but made Topsy canter all the way so that I would get home before dark. Father was just coming in from milking when I rode into our yard. Mother came to the kitchen door and all the youngsters came running out to see me. I hadn't known I was a bit homesick until I got inside of our house, but when they all came running out to meet me, my throat started swelling up. I forgot all about my saddle and everything else, except that I was so glad to be home. It was a fine evening. Mother popped corn and let all of us but Hal stay up until 10 o'clock. I told them all about the mountain ranch and the dogskin water bag and the chuck wagon, but I didn't say anything about sky high or the bucking. Father was awfully quiet, even for him, and I could tell that he knew I was holding something back. I think I would have told him all about it if we'd been somewhere alone, but I couldn't tell him with Mother and the others there. Whenever I wasn't talking, I kept feeling guilty. So I told them all about dragging in wood for Juan's fire and about High having this roan trained so he'd handle any kind of a mean animal without any reining. 
I said Hi was going to teach me how to train a horse that way. Father just said that that, that would be a good thing to learn and that a man who could train a horse like Hi's Blue Roan would be able to teach me lots of worthwhile things about forethought and patience as well as horse handling. Sunday morning, I let Grace ride Topsy up to the corner and back on my saddle. Father went along on Lady because Topsy was a strange horse and he wouldn't trust Grace alone with her. Grace didn't like to have him go with her. I think she always did wish that she'd been a boy so she could have been allowed to do the things that Father let me do. We packed a lunch, a picnic lunch, and spent the whole afternoon down by Bear Creek, but we stayed away from the bridge where Fanny got hurt. Mother had a new book that they bought excuse me, <laughs> that they bought when she and father went to Denver to hear Mr. William Jennings Bryan make a speech. It was the call of the wild, and mother read to us most of the afternoon. I think that I liked that book better than any one she'd read. While she was reading, father and I whittled a sailboat. That is, father whittled the boat part, and I made the masts and split dry Spanish dagger leaves for the sails. Then, Father rigged the sails and booms with string that he had brought in his pocket. He fixed two long strings with the main boom so we could swing it from one side of the boat to the other as we walked along the bank. While Mother and the others were getting supper fixed, Father and I sailed the boat down the creek. At the place where the current wasn't too swift and where there was a pretty good breeze, we sat down on the bank and Father showed me how, the, how we could make the boat go either up or downstream by simply changing the angle of the sail. After I'd learned how to do it and was moving the strings so to make the boat tack up against the breeze, Father said, You know, a man's life is a lot like a boat. If he keeps his sails set right, it doesn't, do, it doesn't make too much difference which way the wind blows or which way the current flows. If he knows where he wants to go and keeps his sail trimmed carefully, he'll come into the right port. But if he forgets to watch his sail until the current catches him broadside, pretty apt to smash up on the rocks. After a little while, he said, I have an idea. You'll find that the current's a bit stronger up at the mountain ranch. Just then, mother hoo-hooed for us. Hoo-hoo! So we took the boat out of the water and went back up the creek. While we were walking, father fastened the strings so that the sail couldn't move and tied the long cord onto the bowsprit. When we got to where mother had supper laid out on the bank, he gave the boat to Philip. We left the creek just when the sun started to dip down over the highest mountain peaks so that I could get back to Cooper's before dark. When I went, father walked out to the gate beside Topsy. He had his hand on my knee and was looking down at the ground, but he said, son, I want you to be a man and do the things men's do. men do, but I want you to be a good man. I'm not going to worry about you, but don't take foolish risks and give the man who's paying you a good day's work. So long, partner. Then he waved to me as he closed the gate. And that was chapter 25. <laughs> we'll read the next one next time. Until then.